I'm gonna be reacting to your writing and publishing hot takes. I asked you guys recently on both my community tab and my Instagram story to send in any unpopular opinions that you might have about writing or publishing, and I'm excited to react to them today. I'm gonna to be letting you know whether I agree with them, my thoughts, and we're just gonna be having a little bit of a conversation. Feel free to leave your thoughts on any of the hot takes that we discussed down in the comments. I do ask that you be respectful towards others' opinions and thoughts. We don't need to be getting in any fights in the comments section, but I got a lot of really interesting ones from you guys, things that I hadn't really thought about that I'm like, yeah, that feels true. If you want to participate in stuff like this in the future, definitely follow me over on my writing Instagram, Brielle's Writing. I'll be posting more sort of prompts on my story and such for videos like this, so definitely make sure to follow me over there. So we're going to start off with the ones that I got on Instagram. We're starting right off the gate with what I would consider one of the hottest takes that I received. There is no writer's block. Some days are harder, but if you're there, some words will be too. So I have mixed feelings, but I would say, Low key, I do agree a little bit. I think the term writer's block is overused for people just not wanting to put in the work sometimes. I'm not saying that's the case every time, but I do think sometimes we use things like writer's block, not being inspired to kind of procrastinate doing the hard work on a book, you know what I mean? I think to think that you're always gonna feel 100% inspired and in flow is like unrealistic. And if you don't feel that way, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're blocked. It might just mean that you need to put your head down a little bit and work through some of the issues. And it might take some time. It might not come easily. Um, but if you sit down, I do think most of the time you will have some sort of progress or you'll be able to do something of value even if your writing is not flowing as well as it does on other days. That being said, I am also a big believer in if you just feel off one day and the words are not coming, take the day off. That's totally fine. But if you you're feeling that way for a prolonged period of time, maybe you just need to work through that block a little bit. That being said, that does not mean it's easy and I don't wanna invalidate people who feel blocked, but I would say that sometimes it can be used as a bit of an excuse for not writing or not just like doing the work. I, I understand where you're coming from with that take. And I agree, some days are harder, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't write if you really put your mind to it. Okay, our next hot take. I find set writing routines extremely creatively limiting Oops. <laughs> I mean, I think I kind of agree as well. I feel like the amount I wanna write on a given day is so dependent on what I'm feeling and what's going on in my day. I love changing up my locations. I really don't think that I would thrive just writing in the same place at the same time every day. Like if I had to sit down at this desk every morning and write for the same set amount of time, I think I would feel so suffocated. So I agree, being able to like sort of mood write, you know, in the way that people mood read, sort of intuitively figure out how much writing am I feeling today? Do I want to go hard? Do I want to just do a taste? Where do I want to write? When do I want to write? Keeping that fresh to me also is really creatively like inspiring and I think helps my process. So I agree. I don't know if I'll ever be a set writing routine girl. It amazes me that so many authors are that way. Okay, this next hot take. You shouldn't cut out scenes that you like because they don't serve the plot. It's your artistic creation. Painters won't cut out pieces of their paintings for selling purposes. I don't know. I don't know my thoughts on this. <laughs> I see what you're saying for sure, for sure. I mean, I think even a scene that doesn't serve the plot directly, maybe it's serving the character growth. Maybe it's building a relationship. And to me, that still serves the book. Also, there is something to be said just for a scene that just brings the vibes. It brings the world building to life. It sets the tone and the atmosphere. Like that's valid too. As long as of course you're not overdoing it and losing any semblance of plot along the way. That being said, I do still think there's something to be said for being mindful when you are revising and if the story needs to be cut down a little bit to work better i still think that's a good idea if your book is like really long or something or it just feels inflated more than it should or than it needs to and you're getting that feedback from other people i do think that's something you need to consider and sometimes maybe you do need to trim so i have mixed feelings i'm not of the belief that like once it's written it's written and you shouldn't touch it i definitely do believe in revising intentionally yeah i, I think it's fine to have characters, you know, hanging out, flitting around a little bit, having a campfire. I'm all for keeping scenes for vibes and for atmosphere and stuff, if it works from a reader's perspective. I don't think authors should do that only to be self-indulgent if the reader is not gonna enjoy it at all, if no readers are gonna enjoy it at all. Like it needs to still be adding something to the story, you know? Next hot take. The term clean romance grinds my gears, although I think this is a popular opinion, LOL. I'm curious, anyone who feels this way, why does this bother you? 
I would like to know because to me it seems like a pretty intuitive way to describe a romance with no spice. Is it because it kind of suggests that a romance with spice is unclean? Because I could see that being um, annoying. <laughs> but I don't know what else you would call it. Like the opposite of spicy is what? Bland? I don't feel like you should call it a bland romance. I also feel like we need to even the playing field in terms of the respect and the chance that we give to books regardless of spice level because I don't love the perception that if a book has spice it's automatically like lower quality it's the plot isn't going to be good the writing isn't going to be good because I just don't think that's true and I also don't think just because a book is clean means it's going to be well written or engaging or the romance will be good I could see where you're coming from there publishing related too much focus on tropes not enough on good and original stories yeah I could totally see that I agree that a story just being good needs to be the top priority. That being said, I understand why in marketing tropes are used so much. It is just the quickest and easiest way to convey what people can expect from your story is like a quick summary of the genre and the tropes. Like it, it just makes sense. I know I'm gonna use a lot of tropes when I'm marketing my book. Honestly, I didn't even realize it had tropes until I started writing it and I was like, oh, it could fit into forced proximity. It could fit into enemies to lovers. And I just think it's smart, unfortunately, to use Use those things when you're marketing because you only have people's attention for a split second. You're not going to be able to show them that it's a good book, a well-written book, an interesting story in two seconds, but you can give them the tropes. So I have mixed feelings. I understand where this sentiment is coming from totally and I don't think a good book is determined by its tropes or that a trope is a, honestly even a great summary of a book, but it is the easiest way to market books. So I understand why authors use it. It just makes sense, you know? I, I feel this from both sides. I understand the frustration from the reader perspective but I also understand why it's kind of a necessary evil from the author perspective. Okay now we're gonna switch over to the hot takes on YouTube. This one got a lot of likes so it seems like a lot of people agreed with this. TikTok really helped indie authors initially. Now it's ruining the indie publishing industry by reducing indie books to being tropey, fanfic -y, and just poorly developed. I, I could see where this is coming from and I also am not on TikTok so my opinion on this really is limited but I will say from what I've heard from other self-published authors TikTok and Instagram Reels is still the best and pretty much the only way that they've been able to significantly scale their sales. So I still think indie authors need TikTok and it's kind of a, a necessary thing at the moment, at least from the authors I've seen. I could see how if a lot of authors are just publishing books very quickly to try and get them viral, how they could end up being like shallow and poorly developed and only written for the sake of being marketable on TikTok. Like I feel like that could end up with a bad book for sure. It's tricky. It's probably just like, you know, very saturated at this point with indie books and a lot of them probably aren't very well written, which sucks because I feel like it's so important for us to improve the reputation of indie publishing. This one is also about trope marketing. Trope marketing gets too specific and really spoils a lot. I could see how it could really spoil a lot if it's a trope like accidental pregnancy or something like that. Like, yeah, that's spoiling what's supposed to be a twist in the book. For me, I'm not overly bothered by a spoiled book. Like for example, I just read Katie Wismer's Marionette series and because I follow her and I've seen so much about the series, I knew in book three that there was gonna be a love triangle and like I knew some of the twists that I could expect to see. And I also had read like reviews and stuff and I still really enjoy that series despite knowing a lot of the things via spoilers. I don't know, I think it depends on the book but sometimes I'm okay with a little spoilery vibes. But yeah, I do think it's best to keep your tropes pretty broad and ideally things that could be kind of inferred from just the overall premise of the book, you know? Things like friends to lovers or enemies to lovers. If you're reading a romance book and they start out as enemies, you know it's <laughs> enemies to lovers, you know what I mean? Or forced proximity is not spoiling anything. So I think those types of tropes are better for not spoiling things. Okay, this next one, yes, I totally agree with. We need to stop making pantsers feel uncomfortable for pantsing and pantsers need to stop trying to be full plotters. I don't get why pantsers feel the need to force themselves into a box of plotting when they clearly don't like it coming from a plantser. I totally agree because I have felt this pressure, even just creating content on YouTube. It feels sometimes like plotting, being a plotter is considered the right way to do it and pantsers are just perceived as lazy. But for me, it had nothing to do with laziness. It had to do with the fact that I didn't have the ideas until I was writing it. And I think that's what people misconceive about pantsing is it's not, oh, I don't feel like doing any of this work. Let's just wing it. It's okay, I have these ideas. I don't yet know these elements, but when I go through the process, I'll discover that and then I'll pull it all together. So I think it's just a misconception about what pantsing done right really is. And I don't think just because you plot a book means it's gonna be good either. You could plot a book and the plotting is a mess 
mess and not interesting and you get into the book and you realize things need to change. Yeah, I agree. I think both strategies are totally valid as long as you're going about it in the right way and still putting in the work and trying to make a good story, you know? But I agree. I don't think pantsers need to fit themselves into that mold and I totally understand the pressure to because people revere outlining as the thing that will save your book. And even my friend is reading Story Genius and some of the way that the author talks about pantsing really grinded my gears. She showed me some like passages. I'm sure it's still a great book with a lot of takeaways, but I really didn't like the way that she like said that pantsing is not a valid strategy because I think it is. I really think it is. And for those of us who like to write intuitively and view it as kind of like a journey and a relationship, I think it makes a lot of sense. Okay, this next one, very hot take, <laughs> but I, I love it. Okay, there are almost no perks to being traditionally published. Trad pub authors still have to market the book anyway, plus they make way less money from their own books and have damn near no control over the creative process, like covers and adaptations. It blows my mind that people avoid indie publishing, especially with how warped the publishing industry has become. I agree with a lot of what this comment says. I will say, I know not very much about the traditional publishing industry. So I'll give that disclaimer that I really can't like agree with there being no perks to being traditionally published because I just don't know enough. I feel like what other people perceive as the perks of TradPub is having people, having a team to help you through the process of revising, etc., and to actually deal with the production and all of that. So I totally see that perspective and not having to like, you know, pay a ton of money out of pocket as indie authors do. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious from the fact that I'm going to self-publish that the amount of control, the creative influence that you get to have when you're indie publishing is something that I think is a huge perk. And yeah, the trad pub industry, from what I've heard about it from people who have queried and all that, seems like a bit of a mess. It seems like a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> and I don't know, it, it sounds kind of terrible, honestly, to try and break into. So I agree that the industry seems like it's it's gotten questionable. And I think if I tried to query, it would be like the worst experience in the world. So I'm glad that I want to indie publish. And I think people still hold traditional publishing to this really high pedestal and therefore are reluctant to even consider indie publishing their books when I think there are traditionally published books that are bad. There are traditionally published books that are good. There are indie published books that are bad. There are indie published books that are good. I think it matters so much more the specific book and the specific author than how it was published. I'm glad that we're starting to break down some of the stigmas around indie publishing and I hope that that continues to happen. Okay, I'm gonna try to summarize this one because it's paragraphs long, but I think too many books are published before they're ready. So many books end up with mediocre quality on the fundamental sentence level and the rest of the story suffers for it. People neglect how powerful polished prose is in making a story come to life and so many books, both traditionally published and indie published, feel half-baked because of it. I could totally see this. This makes a lot of sense to me. I don't think I've quite read a book that was published before it was ready, so I can't fully vouch for this. I feel like you do, especially if you are indie publishing your book, need to go through rounds and rounds of revision and you need to do developmental edits, but you also need to do those line edits and copy edits either by yourself or with an editor because I agree, like polishing the book, making sure that simple things like sentence structure or descriptions that feel clear and visually rich, like words fitting together nicely, all of those things do matter when you read a book and sometimes it's kind of invisible because because that work has gone into it, but it definitely sticks out when a sentence slips through the cracks that just does not feel right, you know what I mean? So I could totally see this, yeah. I think part of it probably comes from the pressure to publish quickly, especially in the indie author space, and also just like, you know, when you get excited about a project, you want it to be out in the world as quickly as possible, and I feel like it could be easy to skim over some of those steps just in an effort to get it out there, but I do think it's important to do those like line edit level revisions because I totally agree that on a sentence level it might seem minuscule but it makes a huge impact on the overall reader experience and I also think sometimes it's a lot simpler than we feel like it is. Even as I've been going through some of my chapters things are sticking out to me on a sentence level of quick changes that I could make just to clean up the sentence. Maybe I'm using two adjectives when I only need one, you know, simple things like that. Maybe the sentence structure could be cleaned up and a little bit more concise or a comma could be removed and replaced Place with a period. Sometimes it's like those little things that when you're drafting, it's it's not what's on your mind. It's not something you're slowing down to pay attention to, but I do think you need to in the future. So I can totally see that. If books on average are getting longer, then we should bring back the episodic plot as a trend. Let the plot breathe, let the characters wander, let the themes become a gradual revelation to prove the author's mastery over their medium. Challenge the attention spans of your readers. I agree on challenging the attention span of readers. Like I feel like some of you guys were getting at with some of the comments about 
about TikTok ruining <laughs> books. I, I think TikTok's ruining people's attention spans in general. Social media in general is ruining people's attention spans. And it makes me really sad that people struggle to sit through a proper full length novel. The way people get intimidated by a 100,000 word book, it's honestly mysterious to me because I've always read long books. But yeah, I think there is something to be said for tell the story the way it needs to be told. Let it meander a little bit. Let it be long and rich and full of moments. That being said, I do think filler in a book can be frustrating as a reader. Like, I don't know if you guys have read A Court of Silver Flames. I enjoyed it overall, but that book did not need to be that long. Like period, it felt very self-indulgent at points because it was repetitive and the meandering scenes weren't really adding anything. So I have mixed feelings. Like I totally see where you're coming from and I agree to let the plot breathe, let characters meander, because I also think that's when the relationship building happens, the like interactions that make us love a love interest happens, you know. I think you need some of that in a in a properly fleshed out rich series or book. But also I think there's two sides to that coin of just like being honest with yourself on how long does this book really actually have to be? And if it's getting ridiculous and some of it really can be cut, I feel like that should still be done. You know what I mean? But I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. If we're gonna let books be long, let them, let them be long. <laughs> let, them, let them take their time. Let them walk around a little bit. I don't know if this is actually unpopular, but I find it so difficult to do writing sprints. I get why other people like them, but they absolutely do not work for me. I honestly totally relate to this. I find that Pomodoro timers and all of that works for me with more dry tasks. But when it comes to a creative task, once I'm in the role, I just want to keep going. Like the only reason I ever do writing sprints is for live streams. Otherwise, I literally never use them. I just sit down and write until I'm out of juice, basically, um, or until I have to go do something else. I also don't use writing sprints, but it does make sense to me why they work for people. I know people like to break it up with like chores or like simple tasks to kind of give their brain a break. Makes total sense to me. And I do think Pomodoro timers are useful for other things. Like I'll use them for editing or something. Editing like a video, not a book. <laughs> but yeah, when it comes to a creative task, once I'm in it, I just want to be in it. I don't want to interrupt myself with a timer going off, you know? That being said, on a day where you're really struggling to get into the project or just motivate yourself to start, or maybe you're with another person and you're doing writing together, I'd see the value of Pomodoros and writing sprints way more if you're in a group or if you're struggling to get started. So those are my thoughts on your writing hot takes. Thank you guys for submitting these. This was so fun. If you got to the end of this video, leave a spicy pepper emoji down in the comments. Quick plug for all my stuff. Follow me over on Instagram, Briella's Writing. If you love the videos and want to support me, I do have a Ko-Fi page linked in the description where you can buy me a virtual coffee. Thank you guys for being here. I appreciate your support so, so much. And I will see you next week with another one. Bye.